Hey, Jordan. Hey, welcome back to Friday Night Fights. Over there, over there is the man, the myth, the legend, the cybersecurity extraordinaire, Scott Rizdahl. How are you? Cheers, Jordan. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Cheers. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Yeah. Every day is Friday when we record podcasts all the time. Every day is Friday on Friday Night Bites. Perpetual That's Friday. Right. That's a good state to live in, right? Yes. Yes. Perpetual Fridays. Saturday never comes. Yeah, maybe maybe not. No, no. Saturdays are pretty nice. <laughs> we'll have to, have to rethink this timeline. <laughs> Uh, what are we What are we talking about this week? So we're talking a little uh, coffee and crypto. Am I correct? We are. Yeah. Um, as the viewers probably already know, we always try to pair uh, a local uh, Minnesota Twin Cities based restaurant or two restaurants with a cybersecurity topic. But this this week we're taking a little bit of a detour, and we're just talking about coffee because you and I are both huge coffee fans. Um, I need it to get out of bed, and so we thought we'd feature some of those instead. Yeah, I, I bathe in it. <laughs> it's good for your skin. And these are the type of tips that you'll get from this show, so stick around. Bathe in coffee, and then cryptos. Tell so we got some some tales from the crypto. <laughs> uh, so let's uh before we jump into the nerdy stuff let's talk about coffee first um yeah we each picked kind of our favorite local twin cities coffee shop and wanted to spread the word um mine for this week is called groundswell they're a little independent Groundswell. ground ground swell well ground swell so grounds what so it's kind of a double entendre yeah, the grounds, right? Yeah, they, they grind well, so it's groundswell. But it's also just like a popular neighborhood community gathering spot. So it's kind of a groundswell of the people coming together to consume caffeine. All right. Well, what do you like about this place? Um, it's so, you know, this is going to sound a little cliche maybe, but it's uh, it's just a great independent, non-corporate, uh, ecologically friendly um coffee joint and they they make really good coffee which is of course necessary but they also um display local art they um provide a lot of space and outlets so you know the college students from the nearby schools can come and study um they do have alcohol they have they have beer and wine um so if you study all day and you're you're burnt out and you want to drink you don't even have to get up off of your table um just a really great spot uh they got every drink you could uh, you could need uh, yeah, not quite. I don't think they have a hard liquor menu, but, um, huh. but, uh, oh, new <laughs> spring menu, huh? Cool. Um, so yeah, they have a full like espresso bar, you know, um, they also have, uh, their own homemade baked goods, which are really good. Um, yeah, it's a humble little place. They've got the, the quaint, uh, little emblems and, uh, and wooden, kind of you know motif going on all over the place of course um big old-fashioned espresso machine um yeah kind of kind of quirky hipster staff which i always appreciate the the personalities um they do have minnesota shaped uh pastries and things which is kind of cool um they have a whole story that you can read about if you want to come on the website they've been around since 2009 um, and they've expanded. They took over kind of the whole first floor of this duplex um, and then the, the adjoining building, too. Um, yeah, it's it's just great. So I, I go there to do tech work, to to just hang out and get over caffeinated and, and work on projects. Oh, yeah. You know, you know yeah. coffee shops is where most work gets done, right? Nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe. Um, so it's over on uh, right off of Snelling. Use VPN, right? Use, of course, you use a VPN. Connect? Okay. Yep, yeah, you have to. You know, it's college students everywhere. But um, they have a calendar. What is it about using a VPN at a coffee shop? Why is that important? Uh, that's a different topic. But if the Wi-Fi is free, uh, you – I can't think of something that rhymes. But you, you anybody can potentially Let's see go, your traffic. Go to chat GPT. It knows how to rhyme. <laughs> we should <laughs> go make back it. to our last episodes. Right, right. Um Anyway, Groundswell is great. Uh, check it out. It is my favorite Twin Cities coffee shop. Yeah, I looked it up, and it says it's in Hawaii. 
It is not. At least not this one. This Groundswell.com is... is in Hawaii, but that's a completely different thing. It is. Yeah. Their website is groundswell.secure-decoration.com, apparently. Oh, that's the <laughs> store. Sorry, that's their store. Groundswellmn.com. Uh, well, what, do you, what do you got for us? So here, honestly, you know, I uh, I don't actually frequent coffee shops in the Twin Cities, so I don't have like a wealth of information to choose from for everyone. Like, but I do know this one place because it's near our office. I've uh, met clients there a few times. Uh, worked there when our power was out uh, in our building a couple times, and and uh, it's it's Swede Hollow Cafe, Swede Hollow Cafe. And um, and it's right. It's located on Seventh Street East, uh, St. Paul, near near Swede Hollow Park, which is maybe where it gets its name, you know. Um, and kind of by St. Paul Brewing. So, so now it's pretty simple. It's a simple place, uh, but they have some beautiful coffee and tea drinks, um, uh, and some like Italian sodas and French sodas and things like that. Um, I don't usually get too creative with my coffee drinks, though, so uh, I can't tell you about all the different, you know, fancy ones because uh, I usually just kind of go straight to the coffee. But their coffee, like just like like you said, a signature good coffee shop has good coffee, they, right? They do just straight up like, you know, not old fashioned, but just solid espresso and, and good drip coffee. You know, they should do pour over as well, right? Um, they mm -hmm. should have the, your dark, your dark blends and your light blends, roasts. Um, yeah, and it's kind of like a house-looking thing. You know, you can kind of go upstairs. In fact, when you go like up to the upstairs, you, you're like, I mean, it's like you're walking through a house. You feel like you're going up, up the stairs of an oh. old house. Hey, is this the place that used to be? Um, it used to have a different name, and then it became a law firm, and now it's Sweet Hollow Coffee. Am I, I don't right? know. It used to be like. Uh, something about a goat. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe yeah. next week we'll we'll come back with the facts on that. All right. All right. That's fair. Yeah. But they do have food too. And and I've never had the food. But it looks delicious and it smells delicious. So that's the other thing I'd say. Great coffee shops have great quality coffee. But also, like Sweet Hollow, the smells when you walk in there and the smells now coffee shops, you know, the, if you are making coffee, you can have somewhat of a nice smell, but like really good coffee shops have like really good smell. <laughs> I'm sensing a pattern here. <laughs> yeah. The prices actually aren't bad too. I always love going to a local coffee shop and it's not more than Starbucks, you know, like it really yeah. should be, but it's, it's, uh, it's just on par. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this looks great. Extra shot of espresso, 75 cents. Yeah, yes, please. Hell I'll yeah. take three. Hell yeah. And Gatorade, if you've had too much coffee and you find yourself to be <laughs> dehydrated yeah. and struggling. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for the rec. I'm going to check it out, and I'm going to confirm that it used to be the Goat Coffee Shop, and I will explain the entire history next time. Oh, I can't wait. All right. Uh, back to crypto. crypto. Back to crypto. Crypto. So um, you and I were planning this episode and we started talking about it and we were like, is this really one episode or is this something that we might try to make into one episode and it runs an hour and 20 minutes and we're still not done and we don't feel happy with how we covered the topic. Right. And we decided this is not one episode. We did. Yeah. So instead, we figured we'd break it up into probably three episodes, this being the first one. And this is really just meant to be an overview and a kind of a brief history of what cryptography is, um, where it came from, uh, some just general places it's used today. A hint, it's used everywhere. Um, and spoiled it. And then tee us up for the next two episodes, which are going to be sort of deep dives into first, just uh, the different types of encryption, how it works, um, you know, how computers do it. And then in mm -hmm. the third part of the series, probably we're going to do some crypt analysis. We're going to try to break some encryption codes um, and, and just do, have some more kind of fun with, uh, with crypto. Yeah, and, and we're going to try. I, like we do every, every time we uh, record, uh, 
if, if you're thinking, boy, cryptography, like this is over my head. Like, what are you even talking about? Man, stick around. We're going to try to keep it uh, in in a place where you can digest it and, and learn about it. And you, and you really should. I mean, this is this is happening all around us in a lot of different ways, finances and all this stuff. And and you should try to learn at least the basics. And then for those of you who are are smart, you know, oh, <laughs> I don't want to say it like that for the I'm going to fly. Anyways, uh, for, for those of you looking for more like security professional. We got that for you, too. We so do. stick around the whole spectrum. All right. But we're taking you back to school first for a quick quick overview back to school so we're going to start from square one this is cryptography 101 so jordan what what is cryptography it's a funny word and uh yeah it's an interesting it's, word it's secrets it's secrets it's uh sending secret messages to people like like those girls there like you know girls whispering in the woods and they don't want anyone to hear what they're saying except the person that they are sending the message to so it's that's what cryptography is it's a it's secret writing secret message it's a way to kind of uh make sure that your message is understood only by the intended recipient and real quick i i, I was laughing at, at your choice of clip art but i actually i really like it because you know in in private right so these two girls are telling some funny story it really is private to them right that one is sending information. One is receiving information. Maybe it goes both ways. Um, but once you get beyond two people in the woods, it gets a lot harder to keep secrets, right? What's right. How does the saying go? Uh, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead or something like that. Right. Um, so, so in our world where, you know, sure, we talk to people face to face, but a lot of what we do is done online, over computers, over the phone. Um mm -hmm we can't assume that anything is that those conversations, those transmissions are secure by default. So enter. Cryptography. Exactly. Yeah. Take, take this analogy of two girls whispering in the woods and now try to send that secret message with a bullhorn. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so now you, you need to tell a message to someone way over there. How do you make sure it's still only received by that recipient when you have to scream it across the entire place and that's kind of what is happening so so with with it you know there's the idea that people can tell that you're sending a message people know that a message is being sent they just can't understand it they can't decipher what it is there you go one more uh one more wrinkle on that is um if those two girls were you know half a city apart screaming through a bullhorn um, how could girl two really know that girl one was the one sending the message? She can't see her. She may Good not recognize point. her voice through the bullhorn, right? So, um, so cryptography can also help us um, verify the sender and recipient of, of information um, too. And we'll dive into yeah. that more later. Yeah, yeah. That's you know you're getting you're getting you're getting ahead of ourselves here. Diving in <laughs> cryptology. So real quick, you know this is just the basics. You know, understanding some some lingo, some uh, stuff. So cryptology is you know, sometimes people kind of interchange cryptography and cryptology, but cryptology is really the science of secure communication. So it includes cryptography, but also it includes the other part of it, which is crypto analysis. And that's de the decoding of the secret messages or the, or the breaking of the encryption. Um, and so cryptology is that whole science of the whole kind of process. So do we need any more terms? Do you think, you think that's enough or is um, I mean, we'll get into the rest. So this is this is the t the umbrella term, and then within that, you know, this is a whole discipline. You can get PhDs in cryptography, basically, right these days. So right. there's, there's obviously a lot to it, and we'll we'll break down some of the other major concepts here in the next uh, few slides and the next few episodes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I might say real quick. So yeah. a couple a couple other key terms I'd probably throw out there is cipher. So cipher. What's a cipher? That's the thing that that's the algorithm that actually you know, encrypts the message, makes the message secret. Sure. Plain, plain text. That's the unencrypted message. That's the actual message, plain text, kind of get it from its name. Um, and so, you know, another way to kind of bring it back to encryption uh, is when you encrypt something, you're converting plain text, plain message to cipher text, which is the hidden message, the scrambled message, the, mm -hmm. you know, 
and decryption turns ciphertext back into plain text. So those, I'll end it with that. Those, those, I wanted to just throw a couple more terms so people kind of get where we're going. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. And that leads us into the next slide, which is just kind of, um, again, the underneath cryptography, the next major concepts or areas of, of cryptography. You gotta, you gotta call a specialist, man. Yeah. There's so something's <laughs> flying around me. So, um, so there's a few major uh, sort of subcategories of, of uh, cryptography or, or uh, things that make up the field of cryptography. Um, one of those is called symmetric key encryption, which is also called so encryption, um, also called private key encryption. Um, and that's, uh, you know, basically you have a, a password, if, if you will, or a, a key that is that can be used both to, to scramble the message, to turn it from plain text into ciphertext, like you said, um, but also to go the other direction, so to go back from ciphertext to plain text. Um, this is this type is great because it's really efficient. Um, it tends to be very fast. Uh, it's also very simple. Um, generally, uh, implementation tends to be easier than some of the other categories. Um, it uh, the the major drawback is that both sides of the communication, both of those you know schoolgirls, need to know the the key or the the secret you know the secret to, to the encryption um, in advance. So they you can't just have two people start talking um, securely with symmetric key encryption. And we'll get back to that in the next episode when we look at how some of modern encryption techniques work. But mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's super efficient uh, uh, and super secure, but you do have to somehow agree on that secure key ahead of time. Uh, the other major branch is asymmetric or public key cryptography. And this one's really interesting because it didn't really exist until like the 1970s. And we have some slides on history of cryptography. We'll see it goes back thousands of years. Um, but this really didn't exist until you know, the 20th century, the mid 20th century, um, when some mathematicians uh, figured out that you could create an encryption algorithm that used one key to encrypt the, the, the message and a separate key to decrypt. Um, and so it, in addition to being able to split that key into two parts, it also lets you do some really cool things like verify who sent the message, which we kind of just talked about, um, and, and a whole bunch of other cool applications. And this really, as we'll see, gave rise to the internet as we know it, to being able to have secure communications between two people who aren't already together in the woods. So Sure, yeah. Yep, we'll get into that. Um, it tends to be a little more uh, computationally intensive, so it tends to take more computer cycles to, to encrypt and decrypt, um, but that trade-off is typically worth the, the benefits that you get. We'll see more about that. Um, also under the, the umbrella of cryptography is uh, something called hashing. And hashing isn't really encryption um, because the whole purpose of hashing is to not be able to retrieve the original message, you might say the plain text, from the ciphertext. The whole purpose is to convert the plain text or a file or a picture or whatever it is um, into, you know, a, sort of an encrypted form, a hashed form, um, but that's unique to the input, but that you can't derive the input from the output. So it's, it's often used as a fingerprint or to generate fingerprints of messages, of files, um, things you download from the internet. Um, and this is also something that's very, very new to the world. This didn't really exist in, in the olden times. Mm -hmm. And last but not least is digital signatures, which is really a combination of public key encryption, public key cryptography, and hashing, typically. And it's used to, as you might guess, um, you know, put a stamp that's hard to forge on a, a message that I send to, to Jordan. And he can say, yep, this really, really came from Scott. There's, there's really no realistic way that somebody else could have, um, could have sent this message unless they have Scott tied up in the basement and they're you know, beating, yeah. him with, beating him with a phone book. So um, those are kind of the main sub parts or, or things that make up cryptography. And we'll, again, jump into all those in the next few episodes. Yeah. Any, any questions, class? <laughs> <laughs> so we, got, we got through the terms. We did. Uh, there will be a quiz on next Friday. There will. Um, so with kind of some of the concepts and terms defined, we wanted to go through the history of cryptography um, very, very quickly um, and, and just kind of give uh, everyone a, a background on 
you know, where, how this came about, what the major contributions have been, the major milestones, and I'm going to let you kick it off, Jordan. Yeah, yeah, because it, like, we're including this again, you know, it does feel like school, but it's like, this was, this was some of the interesting pieces when I, you know, went through the, this part of my training in life. And, and, um, and so it, just the idea that it goes back a long ways and, and, you know, and it happens like, so, uh, before we talk about Egypt, because that's where we, we, we can maybe go back and say, this is potentially where it somewhat began. Maybe, um, I go back to third grade for me. And I remember writing girls' notes. Uh, uh, did you, uh, did you I, encrypt them? And I, I'd encrypt them. Huh. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything about encryption, uh, crypt, you know, cryptology or cryptography. I just knew that I wanted to write a secret message. And, um, and so we did like, you know, it was basically the Caesar cipher, but I didn't know what it was, but it was kind of like, you know, everything, this means this and this, you know, this letter is now this letter. So now, move every letter it, anyways we're jumping ahead of myself i'm just saying that i i knew cryptography in third grade <laughs> it can't be that hard then it can't be that complicated <laughs> but no so so first recorded crypt, cryptography uh, goes back you know almost four thousand years egyptian hieroglyphics those were indecipherable for a long time so it's kind of you know the the egyptian hieroglyphics is kind of just like a language right so you might not right away think it's cryptography but what makes it kind of like this earliest idea of cryptography is that i mean there were puzzles mixed in with the with the pictures uh that that the egyptians carved on these caves and different things but um but we just couldn't under you couldn't completely understand it people tried to interpret them but until they found the Rosetta Stone in 1799, which included a way to kind of uh, at least uh, uh, relate it to a known language, Greek, uh, th they were just kind of shooting in the dark. Like, oh, yeah, here's a picture of a guy with a dog head. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, maybe it means this. Until that Rosetta Stone, until they had the key, they couldn't decipher what it was with yeah any it's interesting because kind of it, it wasn't maybe necessarily meant to be a secret code but exactly. it was, a, it was a, a indecipherable language that um that had meaning hidden in it and until people found the key like you say um they weren't able to to decrypt it yeah and that's why it comes up as as you know probably the oldest you know example of it is because it, it there's principles in in mm -hmm. What's next? And then what happened? So yeah, just kind of some some uh, some you know cons uh, what's the word anecdotal uh, examples. So um, I found some references in my own research that uh, that somebody three thousand five hundred years ago or something used it to to uh, hide the their recipe for pottery glaze. And the, the article I read thought that they probably tried to hide it because their recipe had some you know economic value, right? Oh, so, sure, yeah. so somebody had had really perfected the pottery glaze way back then, which was advanced technology in, you know, fifteen hundred BCE, um, and they wanted to hide it, so they did. They wrote it down, but they they uh, tried to keep it a secret. Yeah. So so again, like uh, like you had kind of commented off camera, uh, it goes back as long as secrets existed. Yep. Potentially, you know. Yeah, almost as long. I mean, a secret by definition is something that not everyone is supposed to know. So there must be some way to, to hide that information, right? To hide the message. Um, there were also references that scholarly knowledge of various kinds was was uh, encrypted or, or hidden. Um, so it could be kept to just the, you know, the, the cloistered few, the, the people who um, were approved to have that knowledge, whatever it was. Knowledge is power, right? You watched Saturday morning TV just like I did. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I even found some references to, uh, to encryption of some form or another being used in the Kama Sutra or, or taught through the Kama Sutra, the Indian, you know, text on, on how to achieve enlightenment or whatever through, through sex. 
um, and and they would teach uh, simple ciphers that that lovers could use to to share uh, their feelings with each other. I suppose you know. Yeah, that was what I did in third grade. <laughs> there you go. You were uh, not ahead of the times, but um, you were right there with the the authors of the Kama Sutra. Were you reading the Kama Sutra, Jordan, in third grade? It, I mean, it was mandatory reading in my school. <laughs> Man, wasn't that North Dakota? That's pretty advanced for North Dakota. <laughs> no, uh, no. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, flashing forward in time a little bit, uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans, who we have a lot of, uh, you know, historical writings from, the, um, you know, one of those civilizations that wrote a lot of stuff down. Um, we have uh, writings that show that they used early ciphers, the Caesar cipher you mentioned, um, to hide military and political secrets. Um there's some really interesting references, and this isn't technically encryption. It's something we'll talk about next time called steganography. Um, oh, yeah. But, but uh, there's there's anecdotes about uh, one side or the other shaving the head of somebody, tattooing a right. message on their head, and then letting their hair grow back. And then they would, you know, cross enemy lines or whatever, and they would, um, you know, they'd shave their head again, and then the message would be retrieved. So it's more yeah. steganography is like hiding things in plain sight, kind of. Um, right. as opposed to encrypting them, but um, still another early uh, use of something that you could call cryptography, right? Yeah. Um, going forward again, uh, as with mathematics in the like 8th to 13th or 14th or 15th centuries, um, the Arab world contributed a huge amount to to encryption. There were a couple of, or to cryptography, there were a couple of books written at the time that were basically like the the book, right? The book on... Uh, the textbook on how to how to have uh, basic crypto systems. A lot of stuff at the time was um, similar to the Caesar cipher. It was you know substituting one letter for another to hide the real message. But um, these scholars took it a step further and and looked at you know um, using sets of letters to to encrypt, which are harder to decipher than single letters. Mm -hmm. um, they just made huge advances, and and uh, you know mo the modern encryption world owes a ton to to that period of time in that part of the world. Um, eventually, Europe kind of took the baton and, and uh, started developing during the Middle Ages when there were, you know, wars and religious conflicts and things like that, where, again, there was a need to have secrets kept and, and uh, not uncovered by the other side. Um, and it just kept being used and, and developed and iterated and, and uh, improved upon over time uh, until we get to kind of the, the early modern era. I mean, what's the, what's the point of of encrypted messages and war nowadays when you got media that just kind of you, you do a a briefing every day, like, and they tell them our stra strategy, right? No, no. Oh. The stuff that makes it on TV is is presumably not the same thing that the soldiers are hearing or that the generals are are telling to the troops, right? Um, <laughs> and so, in I, I hope not. <laughs> in the 19th and 20th centuries, we saw it get used even more in, in wartime and in politics, um, you know, as governments uh, matured and, and uh, these, these major world wars were fought, um, it, it was even more important to come up with new unbreakable codes. Um, a great example that probably a lot of people know, there's a great movie about it, was the Enigma machine, um, which was the Nazis kind of most advanced uh, encryption decryption system. Um, mm -hmm. There was also the, the Navajo uh, code talkers uh, during World War II um, on the Allied side who used the Navajo language as a as a uh, sort of encryption method, a cipher all itself, um, which I think wasn't cracked by the by the other side um, before the end of the war. Uh, the Enigma machine was the little guy on the left there, and it was a you know fully mechanized um, you know it almost looks like a computer if you squint really hard. Um, yeah, like typewriter. And, yeah. And the Allies, uh, specifically uh, Great Britain, England, um, cracked it uh, at uh, is it Bletchley Park? Is that how you say it? Uh, it was uh, I don't. I can't say how you say it, but yes, in Bletchley Park. Yeah, something like that. Um, so they had kind of this, you know, this this uh, this super secret research center in in rural England, and and uh, they got all some smart people together. Um, uh, Alan Turing, of course, worked there, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and they were able to break it. And some people think that's what turned the tide of the war. Is now the Allies could see, uh, could you know, pick up over the radio um, the messages that were going between, uh, you know, 
co combatants and, and generals and, and such on the battlefield, and they could all of a sudden know where the submarines were going, know where the tanks were going, know what the movements were. And yeah. um, it was incredibly huge advantage. huge advantage, yep, and probably did turn the tide of the war. Yeah, yeah, uh, a British cryptanalyst, 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 I think, yeah, cryptanalyst, yeah, uh, Sir uh, Sir Harry Hinsley, hmm. Henry Her Harry Hinsley, Sir Hinsley. Anyways, uh, yeah, he think he he said that he thinks that it ended the world the the war like three years earlier, like it would have lasted until 1948 if they hadn't broken this code. Which is crazy because I think like right near the end, 44, 45, the Germans were, were um, uh, perfecting the basically ICBMs, you know, super long range missiles. They were the V3 rockets or something. I forget the name. But um, they were so close to being able to use those, which would have given them a huge leg up. Um, so, yeah, another three years of the war could have changed everything. Right? Yeah, it could have changed everything. Yep. Yep. And and uh, and it wasn't the it wasn't the guys with the guns. It wasn't the the generals. It was the nerds in Bletchley right. Bletchley Park who who uh, who saved the day. You know, which is pretty cool. And and that really you know continued. And we'll see that too in in more history. But the nerds really did become the heroes in a lot of ways. And it, brute force doesn't win that many wars on its own anymore. So. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Not nowadays. It's yeah. It's a yep. cyber war, my friends. So after World War II, um, you know, in the, especially in the 70s and the 80s, you had these university researchers, um, mathematicians basically by trade, right? Because cryptography didn't necessarily exist as, a, as an academic discipline yet, or if it did, it wasn't very mature. Um, and so you had people who were really mathematicians first, who were math experts, who found ways to use basically cool mathematical tricks to take encryption to take cryptography to that next level and like i said earlier about public key encryption to invent whole new ways to to encrypt things that that were like total sea changes from you know the, the last what 3500 years mm -hmm. um and and those very organically but also very quickly led to you know today where we have where my computer can talk to a computer halfway around the world um, that it's ne that it has never met before, it's never talked to before, and they can, within a second or two, set up a secure channel in a way that's not breakable by anyone, as far as we know. So, it's amazing. It is, yeah, it's amazing, and it's still it's still progressing in real time. Um, we should probably talk about quantum computing, quantum computing, and, and encryption. Yes, we probably should. We should, and we will, maybe in episode three. So, <laughs> teaser. So yeah, stick around for part two and three, boys and girls. That's right. It only gets better. Um, to close out today, we just wanted to mention, in case anybody who's watching this has any doubts about the importance of this nerdy, formerly nerdy and esoteric, uh, you know, branch of mathematics and computer science, um, how important cryptography is today, and and how it's really essential for modern life. Um, so we have a list here. You can read them. Um, these are things that wouldn't exist today, couldn't exist today without encryption um you know banking e-commerce um uh, badging into your office building almost everybody who works for a company with more than 100 people does that these days you know um, military of course um, wireless communications uh, my ability to make a phone call on the on the cell here that you can't listen to or anybody can't listen to um, cryptocurrency which is all the rage right now um, bitcoin ethereum these things are in, they are encryption. They are cryptanalysis. That's how they work. Part four will give you some investment advice on which bit, which uh, <laughs> cryptocurrencies to invest. We're gonna in. we're gonna plug some some uh, lesser known coins uh, and run a pump and dump scheme here. So watch watch <laughs> out, SEC. Or we're gonna make some money off of this. Friday um, night coins. Friday night coins. It's a new podcast that's gotten Jordan. <laughs> no, but yeah, you're right. I mean, and and I I kind of think too like what when the internet emerged like had they already thought about cryptography or like for how long were things and like how long how long did bad actors kind of realize that wow i can just kind of grab this information it's just free and clear out in the before they actually started thinking holy god we gotta for sure yeah, um, you know, SSL, the the sort of in-transit encryption standard that in some form is still with us today, 
it didn't come around until the mid 90s and uh, and it wasn't really widely used until the last 10 years you know there's been this huge push to to encrypt all the things um, and that's really just a you know early 21st century phenomenon. So right. you're right. You know, in the in the earliest days of the internet or the ARPANET or whatever you want to call it at the time, um, these there were dedicated links right between these different um, research centers and universities, and security wasn't really a concern. But as people started plugging in and dialing in, logging on, um, and started sharing secrets, right, uh, it became necessary. And so these almost separate uh, discoveries of, of public key encryption and hashing and all these things we'll talk about next time, um, they they were at the right place at the right time, and they got plugged in and built into the system. Um, mm -hmm. But it didn't happen instantly, and it didn't happen without uh, some casualties along the way. And, um, and I, I mean, I know I certainly was not thinking about security or privacy when I, when, you know, I first got introduced like went to my first email address and then all these sites and then you just kind of went anywhere and everywhere and it was like a free for all. And, uh, and yeah, and some people today are still kind of in that mindset. They just kind of still kind of think that they didn't trust things. And this, this came, this link came through and the site must be good. Right. It looks decent. Yeah, and maybe it has the little green lock, right? So of course it's trustworthy. Yeah. We should we should talk about what the little green lock actually means sometime. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so so the last bullet point here: it, it, encryption is everywhere. It's everything. It's it's needed for the most basic functions of of daily modern life now. Um, and without it, uh, our money wouldn't be safe. Our our secrets wouldn't be safe. Um, what we watch on the internet wouldn't be safe, right? Like th this is all mm -hmm. stuff that we take for granted now that um, that has only existed in its modern form for a few decades, but has been around, you know, in principle for, like we said, almost 4,000 years. So super fascinating. And, and one nice thing about thinking about the history, bringing people through the history too, is is that there are, it's probably important for people to know, you know, uh, uh, technologies, crypto cryptographies uh, that are kind of outdated, that are obsolete now, that have been broken. And so you, what you used to think, you know, speaking of wireless communication, you used to think, oh, you know, WEP for my, for my wireless, that's good. That's, that's good. Well, it's, it's, it would behoove you to know that it's not good anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. And so this is what you're kind of saying is this is something you know, it used to be that there were centuries between major advancements, but now it's just a few years between what was secure and what is no longer secure. And uh, and not to get back too much to it, but um, quantum computing is doing that again right now with, with uh, mainly public key encryption. Um, so everything that we, you and I, have been saying is super secure for the last 10, 20 years um, is now potentially up in the air again. And uh, and it just keeps just keeps on rolling, and no one quite knows where it's going to end up. So, yeah. So there there you have it. I mean, is that is that all we got for him today? Just a little uh, just a little teaser. Yeah. A little teaser. Yeah. So again, next time we're gonna we're gonna dive into some of the kind of the main algorithms and and ciphers and encryption techniques used today. Uh, we'll give some examples. We'll we'll look yeah. at some code. Um, some demos yeah we'll do some right. demos and we'll just kind of help people uh get a working understanding of how today's encryption technology works um and then we'll keep going with this series as long as we find interesting topics to jump on so yeah stick yeah, around yeah. yeah part one part two part three come on back thanks for joining us scott always a pleasure always always see you next time Jordan. Friday night bites. bye bye